सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली वी ऑल न्यू दट टर्की वॉज गोइंग टू है जनरल इलेक्शन अराउंड दिस टाइम दिस ईयर बट इफ यू एट आस्क मी सिक्स मंथ बैक अबाउट सिक्स मंथ बैक if i might be featuring turkish elections turkish presidential elections in an episode of kartak letter i would have said unlikely because you know this looked like such a one horse race it looked like erdogan was said to get another fresh term and maybe a couple more because he had made enough amendments to his system and constitution etc etc just use his using his dictatorial powers to make himself even more of a stronger elected dictator that he could have carried on in fact even contesting up to 2034 right 2034 how how old would he be by then so he had given him enough power and it looked like he was way ahead of his so far ahead of his rivals that there there was going to be no contest that has changed now that has changed now which is the reason we are featuring turkish election in this episode of kartak letter because if you look at the opinion polls coming out now i know opinion polls are dodgy opinion polls have been very dodgy even in america donald trump most most polls had shown that he was losing but he had won the first time second time opinion polls had shown him losing sort of by much wider margin than he eventually did the election became much closer so opinion polls can be dodgy and you might say if you are a supporter of the political right that opinion polls have been more dodgy when it comes to assessing the public opinion in favor of the political right so all those qualification apart if you take all those qualifications also into account it would look like that what we are seeing right now by way of opinion polls it tells us that this is a much closer election than erdogan had ever imagined much closer and if anything if anything marginally marginally he may be a little bit behind he may be struggling now the incumbent can get a lot of energy can campaign has the resources he controls the media the state media is with him in fact the state tv trt the turkish radio and television that gives him enormous amounts of time so if you go by the data available from independent watchers in turkey the state television and radio have given in the past 4 weeks leading up to the elections it has given him 3600 minutes of time of air time and how much air time has it given the opposition 42 minutes and the leader of the opposition that is kemal kelish darolu and i hope i pronounced the name right he has said he said when he got the time to appear on national tv he basically upbraided them saying that look you guys you were, you are not telling the truth you are only telling propaganda but once again even in terms of numbers you can see 3600 minutes versus 42 minutes and and the official radio and tv have spent a lot of time a lot of air time actually attacking the opposition so he's got a lot of that tailwind with him so could he make a recovery we don't know but the fact is that he had never imagined that this will become a close battle so close that he will have to worry about winning a fresh term until 6 months back it was a done deal nobody not even his worst opponents or critics thought that he was going to lose or it was even conceivable that he could lose so see this spectator index uh, poll and politico poll of polls also if you see this data the first one in the first round turkey has a two round system that is unless one candidate gets 50% in the first round there is a runoff which means all other candidates drop off and top two have a runoff in the first round the spectator index is sh- showing kemal kilic darolu getting 49% a short of 50% 49% and erdogan getting 45% and two other candidates that is muharram inse and sinan ogan getting 2% each now if this is the result then these two 2% balas will drop off and then there will be a runoff if there is a runoff then the same spectator index poll is telling us 
that this will be a dead heat. That is Kilesh Tarolu and Erdogan getting 50%, 50% each. If you see the comments on this tweet where Spectator Index has put out this data and also the political poll of polls, which also gives you exactly the same, same dead heat, 50%, 50%. You see some of the comments and I'm sharing, sharing one with you just for a little smile or a laugh. This is somebody saying, oh, after the second round, both of them go straight for penalties because it will be a draw. So this has become such a close election, a close election. But at this moment, the opponent to Erdogan just a wee bit ahead. Now, I'm not saying that this is a decisive lead, but the fact is that this has become a contest that nobody had imagined this would become by now. Now, who is who is in the battle? It is two coalitions. So one is a very strong right wing nationalist slash Islamist coalition that Erdogan has put up, built around himself. Erdogan has with him two strong nationalist and Islamic parties, his own party, AKP. And these are sort of complex names because the names are all in Turkish. And I will read this out to you. So his party, AKP, it's also called in English, Justice and Development Party. In Turkish, it is Adalat, Adalat, obviously justice, Adalat ve Kalakena Parti C. Parti C is party. So party he set it up about a little over 20 years ago. Then his partners, he's got two, two partners which are further to the right. In fact, very far to the right to the extent of being neo-fascist. So there is MHP, which is MHP is Miliyetchi Harkat Parti C. And BBP, BBP is Boyak Birilik Parti C. These are his partners. He's up against a big tent coalition of six parties that Kamal Kilesh Darolu has put together. And that's a formidable combination as well. Those are parties which don't always agree with each other's politics or ideology. Kamal Kilesh Darolu himself is a socialist. In fact, he was vice president of Socialist International for many years. So he is a committed socialist, but not everybody in his party is the same way. Now, the difference is, the big difference is, that Erdogan is still going to the polls with his, with his strongman, nationalist, Islamist image. He is accusing his opponents of being pro-Western, such, such a big crime uh, in a country which is a member of NATO, uh, pro-Western, pro-LGBT rights, right? Because, because Erdogan is riding the Islamist bandwagon, he's attacking the gay populations and he is accusing his opponents of being pro-LGBT, not very different from what, from what Putin is doing in Russia. So in many ways, he speaks or he works or he operates from the same playbook as, as, as Putin. So for example, Putin at one point of time stepped down from being president to prime minister, made Medvedev the president, that's only to get around a limitation on terms, but made sure that the real power remained with him, whether he was pre president or prime minister. Erdogan has done something very similar himself. 2003, he came to power. He won three terms as prime minister, then elevated himself to president. First, he elevated himself to president, changed, changed his constitution. His prime minister was there, Namka Vaste, just in a name for the namesake. Although it looked like notionally that more power resided in the prime minister constitutionally than in the president, but that was not the reality. In the course of time, he made his prime minister completely irrelevant and abolished the office. In 2017, he also held a referendum which pretty much, I'm not saying fully abolished parliament, but basically took away all the powers of parliament, made president into a dictator. President can now could now appoint judges, governors, Anybody could do anything, could make laws, could pass laws on the run. So he became an elected dictator. So when you talk about elected dictators, Putin is not a very good example because Russia was never a democracy in that sense. Turkey, with all its, its imperfections, was a better democracy, was a less imper much less imperfect democracy than Russia. And it is there that he gave himself all these powers and became an elect, like elected dictator. The difference between the quality of Turkish democracy and Russian democracy, and I say this positively for Turkey, is that in Turkey now it is still possible to have an election where the incumbent strongman may lose power. And his challenger, his challenger, Kilic Darolu, he has said that if he comes to power, 
if he comes to power he will then become prime minister he will abolish this kind of all powerful presidency he will restore the supremacy of parliament he will also restore the old system which all democracies must have of separation of powers among various institutions so there is not one dictator and he also says that he will get out of his party leave his party so he becomes a non partisan ruler and the five other partners in his coalition will have a vice president each to begin with until he changes the system so this is also now a contest between two systems erdogan is going to the polls saying my dictatorial system strongman system is the best my strongman islamist conservative nationalist system is the best the other side is saying no let's restore our more classical democ democracy let's go back to an a more conventional model of democracy with separation of powers with some patience with a leader with a chief executive who's not so powerful so the turks have to make that choice do they like a strongman government a lot of the democracy seem to like that late these days or are they willing to make a big change that is the big contest right now now erdogan has run a very rough government very rough and tough government he for example has been jailing journalists left right and center at any point of time over the past 5 7 years almost a decade turkey has had more journalists in jail than any other country than any other country he in fact jailed an opposition leader a leader from kirish taulu's party for 25 years for 25 years on spnr charges for quote and quote leaking something to a newspaper in fact it was in response to that that kelish darolu carried out a march of 420 kilometers like one of our padyatras and that was called his march for restoration of justice so at the age of 69 he had at istanbul to ankara march of 420 kilometers for 25 days and thereby rebuilt his reputation because he's been losing a lot of elections one of the things that now erdogan is saying about him is that you you are not even competent you are you cannot even herd sheep right ab bhede bhi nahi chara sakte you've lost nine elections you will lose the 10th one also however things have now changed and one of the reasons the mood is changed we've seen that for the past couple of years turkey's inflation has been rising 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 and the value of the lira has been declining 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 so if you see turkish inflation turkey's inflation was actually 85% in october 6 months back that was the peak from 85% let's now come to 43% now 43% is a very high rate of inflation reserve bank of india has a target of 4 to 6 6% right if it goes to 5.5% they start worrying goes above 6% all kinds of circuit breakers come in they start raising the rates in turkey people maybe are now heaving a sigh of relief that it's come from 85% to 43% but 43% is very severe inflation and it's hitting people very badly although turkey is not a poor country turkey still has a per capita gdp per capita income nominal basis not ppp nominal basis of about 12000 dollars that's more than china at the same time see where turkey has been on its economic journey under erdogan when he came to power he ran a more believe it or not relatively more liberal government and i will tell you why and then turkey's economy boomed turkey's economy boomed between 2003 and 2013 10 years turkey's gdp went up 3x three times but since then since he became powerful and so popular and he got reelected the third time he became a lot more dictatorial and he started doing his whimsical things and his economy has begun to decline so, so after that turkey has seen a gdp decline for 10 years the lira which 5 years back was 5 lira to a dollar is today 20 to a dollar see that chart it's a straight forward google chart what's he been doing as his inflation goes up as his inflation goes up all over the world as inflation goes up central banks increase rates in his case as inflation goes up he decreases rates right he decreases rates and if a central bank governor refuses to do it he just fires them so he's been running this unconventional unconventional economic policy also again his rival says that he will restore it international experts say that if his rival comes to power and they start 
repairing the repairing the economy maybe by the end of 2023 the inflation rate will be about 30 percent will decline further but once again it is such a divided population so i'll share with you the link of an article by dexter filkins in 2017 where he quotes james jeffrey a former u.s ambassador to turkey who says look half of after the after the referendum results came out referendum referendum that made Erdogan into a dictator. He did not win that referendum by a large margin. It was almost 50-50, which is the situation now. He then got the help of the ultra-right parties, which he has with him also, to get that marginal vote to become that dictator, to get all these powers and to get rid of his parliament and to get rid of his cabinet system. He can now appoint his cabinet ministers, fire his cabinet ministers, governors of provinces, everything. He can fire his central, central bank, he runs it like an executive chief of, chief of it, he can appoint his judges, he can fire his judges. There, were, there was a particular corruption case against one of his ministers and there when the prosecutor started also pointing at certain things that involved or that sort of drew into its net, the corruption net, Erdogan's family also, some members of Erdogan's family also. What did Erdogan do? He simply fired the prosecutor. Now that referendum that gave him that power was, was a dead heat as well. So there is James Jeffrey, a former US ambassador to Turkey, quoted by Dexter Filkins as saying, look, look at this situation. Half the country loves him, half the country loathes him. So that is the kind of country that is going to elections now. Now there is also in the same article, Dexter Filkins article, I find a quote attributed to Erdogan. Now we don't find a source for that quote except for this article. but. What is Erdogan quoted as saying? Erdogan is quoted as saying, and I quote here, democracy is like a train you get off once you've reached your destination. And the, and the interpretation then is that 2003, he came to power. He used democracy to come to power. Over 15 years, he rode that train of democracy. And when he was so popular that he, he could convert this into supreme dictatorial power for himself, he got off that train. Now, I told you early on that when he came to power in 2003, it looked like Turkey was going to have a secular government. And a lot of the world, particularly the Western world, was happy because the Western world was still sort of reeling under the blow of 9-11. They were trying to figure out the Islamic world. So they thought that this was a moder modernizing Muslim leader who would come into Turkey through a democracy. Before that, Turkey had a secular government, but it was a secular military government which was very, very repressive. So from that repressive, militaristic, though secular system, the election through a proper election of Erdogan was seen at that point to be a liberal move forward, a move towards liberal democracy. That has got completely reversed now. And that is what Kemal Kilic Daulu and his six-party coalition is now trying to challenge. So once again, we keep pointing out to you the state of the world. The state of the world, now there was a time when Trump was in power, when it looked like the whole world, whether you went clockwise or anti-clockwise, it was run by strongmen of the nationalist right. There was Donald Trump, there was Putin, Xi Jinping, Narendra Modi, Erdogan, Netanyahu, and so on and so forth. Boris Johnson at that point, Orban in Hungary, and Bolsonaro in Brazil. Now some of them have gone. Netanyahu has gone and come back. Uh, uh, Trump has gone most definitely. Putin kaim hai, Xi Jinping kaim hai. Mr. Modi keeps on getting more and more popular, but Bolsonaro has gone, Orban is still powerful, and now there is a question about Erdogan. If he loses now, it would mean that from this super powerful team of strongmen of the nationalist right who rule so many important countries in the world, one more wicket would have fallen. It hasn't happened yet. The difference is six months back, we would have said there's no chance of this happening. Today, there's a chance of this happening. So while on the 13th of May, you watch for Karnataka results, on the 14th, also look out for what comes out of Turkey. Because remember, Turkey is a very important country for the world, for the region, for NATO, for Russia, for Ukraine, for continuing shipments of grain out of Ukraine and Russia, but also it's very important for India. Because traditionally and also in Erdogan years, 
in particular, it has become a very close friend of Pakistan's for its own reasons, because Pakistan is also a market for many of the things that Turkey produces, including its drones.